Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to all of you that are watching on TV. Today is our Sabbath school lesson study. We are coming live to you from Fairmont Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lodi, California, United States. Today, more than 25 million worshipers in different formats are worshiping God on the Sabbath day in over 202 countries. And what is so neat, what is so unique about the Adventist faith is that as a church, we have Sabbath school quarterlies. And these Sabbath school quarterlies are being watched and read systematically by a number of, a number of Seventh-day Adventist people, which is kind of nice. So today we're going to talk about lesson number two. Lesson number two talks about the origin and the nature of the Bible. The Bible, as we know, is the Word of God. And God has given this Bible to us. His Word is in the Bible. And what He has done over the course of years is that He has preserved this truth for us. And so we'll talk about this lesson study. is going to involve six lessons. And the first one is on Sunday. It talks about the divine revelation of the Bible. Monday is the process of inspiration. Tuesday is the written word of God. Wednesday is the parallel between Jesus and the scriptures. And Thursday is understanding the Bible in faith. And of course, on Friday's lesson, we usually have a few questions. So let's talk about Sunday, the divine revelation of the Bible. What is the word. What does the word revelation mean? It is the act of revealing and or communicating divine truth. In other words, you have the divine truth and then you have to reveal the divine truth. And not only does God have to reveal it, but he also has to help us communicate this. And here is where the rubber meets the road. This is the crux. Not just the revelation part of it, but the divine communication. God comes on the scene and he reveals the truth. But it doesn't end there. You see, God has got to reveal the truth and he also has to communicate the truth to us. And here's where we as his hands, we as his feet, we as his fingers come into play. So how does God reach out to man, you may ask? How does God reach out to man? So there are three different ways God reaches out to man. The first one is illumination. Illumination is a divine spark that momentarily ignites the conscience. For example, here is a man coming to attack you. You're in the grocery store, you're doing your own thing. And here's a guy that comes in the back and he wants to grab your purse. And all of a sudden, as he's trying to grab your purse, he has this divine illumination that he shouldn't do this. And so he responds to this call and he doesn't do it. And that is a divine spark, a divine spark that momentarily ignites. Well, the second one is inspiration. Inspiration is a lengthy encounter with God. God says, listen, you have been faithful to me. Now I'm going to involve you into transmitting some of the truths that I have given you to others. And so what happens is God comes in and says, Hey, listen, I'm going to give you a lengthy encounter with me. Well, the third one is revelation. You might ask, how does that differ from inspiration? See, revelation is, a, is an invitation to enter the realm of God. God invites us. He says, you have been so truthful to me. You have been so honest with me. You've gone through like Job, like Moses, like Daniel. It is time for you to come into my presence. And God invites us into that presence. That is called revelation. And so if you, if you draw a timeline or if you, if you draw a line, you would say that the initially the starting point would be illumination. And then you would go into inspiration. And then you would go, of course, into revelation. Well, it doesn't stop there. You might ask, then how does man communicate? That is called inscripturation. 
It is the process by which man communicates with God, what God has shown him. It is colored by man's own unique experience. For example, let's take a look at Moses. Moses was trained to be a pharaoh. Well, God had to make him a shepherd, right? And look at Amos. Amos was a shepherd. And so as you read the book of Amos, what you find is that here is a farmer trying to explain who God is all about. And look at David as a king, a shepherd. And that is why he coins this beautiful Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with me. And then you have Daniel. He's a statesman. He is in the presence. He is in the king's court. And so the images that he uses are all associated with the cherubims, with the, with the, with the lions, a symbol of, of, of Babylon. So you find all these color tours, these colors coming through from the writings of these great men. And you also look at Luke. Luke is a doctor. He looks at, he, 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 he put some very interesting terms there. I mean, look at Paul. He was a scholar. And so he, to him, to Paul is given the directive to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And then you also have Matthew, tax collector. And then you have John, a fisherman. You see, there are 40 writers involved in writing this one message, this one author who is God himself. And he comes in and he chooses over 40 different writers. And they write 66 books. And there's one common thread. That is how fantastic the hand of God is. See, God chooses people of different walks of life. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a carpenter. You could be a construction worker. You could be a, a computer geek. You could be a doctor. You could be a nurse. You could be a businessman. But all that God wants is someone that says, Here am I, God. Send me. And the truth is very simple. The truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, that is what the lesson study is all about. And so let's go into Monday. What is the process of inspiration? So Monday's lesson talks about what is inspiration. Okay? So look at, all, look at, this, look at this text, 2 Timothy 3.16. It's a very powerful text that showcases what this term inspiration is all about. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The word God-breathed is where the term inspiration comes from. It comes from the Greek word theonoustos. Theonoustos. Two words put together. Theos, we all know what theos is, God. And we all pretty much know, most of us know what pneuma is. Pneuma is breath. And so god breathes into it. God breathes. The word takes on life when God breathes into it. You see, God takes man. He makes him out of clay. An inanimate being. And he comes in and he breathes into him, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man becomes a living creature. You see, God takes his word and he breathes into the word. And guess what happens? The word takes on life. How does the process of inspiration work? Here is God. God comes in and he says, you know what? I'm going to take 40, 50 people. I'm going to choose them over the years, over, 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 over a period of time. I'm going to choose them. I'm going to give them this message. And now they're going to write this. They're going to, it becomes a written word. And then after the written word, we come on to play, and God gives us this word. The word is the Bible. And it's a, it's a cycle. It's a beautiful cycle. God to authors, to the written word, and to us. And over the course of time, God is eternal. God is immortal. God is all-compassing. And so what does God do? He gives a message that is trans-time, as it were. And so, on Sunday, the divine revelation of the Bible... Monday is the process of inspiration. On Tuesday, the written word of God. 
So now we come to the written word of God. How does God preserve his word over a course of time? You see, we look at God in a very myopic way. We look at him and you look at him and we say, you know what, how can God do this? Through the eyes of man, it is impossible. But through the eyes of God, nothing is impossible. You see, God gives man the message. Man has got two ways he can do this. Oral tradition or he can have a written tradition. In other words, he can pass it on from generation to generation through word of mouth. Well, the problem with that is that he tends to embellish and the details are forgotten. If you're like me, when you observe an accident, for example, five different people have five different stories. But on the other hand, if it is written down, the factual, time-sensitive material is written down. If that material is written down, it stands the test of time. Someone that can come back 50 years from now and read about that accident as if it happened today. So how does God work? If it is not written down, it did not happen. And so you find God time and again telling his people, telling his writers, telling his prophets, write these down, write these down. Because he knows that the incident over time, as time marches on, people tend to forget. Well, we have a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting um, a curve. It's called the forgetting curve by the Ebbinghaus curve. It's called the Ebbinghaus curve. Dr. Ebbinghaus in the 1800s came up with this idea that, hey, you know what? People are forgetting things. And so he, he started to chart them. And you find that on the first day, you remember 100% of the story. 100% is you remember the first day. Well, the second day, the, well, the, it, the, when the incident happened, the first day, 124 hours later, you remember only 80%. And then you come to the second day, guess what happens? Look, it's gone down to 50 and so on and so forth. By the end of day number seven, you have only 10%. Or less that you remember. So how does God work with this situation? God says write it down. If it is not written down. It didn't happen. That is why you should keep a faith journal. Write on a piece of paper. Write in a book. How God has led you in the past. What did he do for you yesterday? Did he do 10 things? Did he do 11 things? Did he do nothing in your life? Write them down. Chart them down. So as you chart them down. You find that. In times of frustration, in times of, of pressure and stress, you tend to open that book and you see, hey, you know what? God has led me in the past. He's not going to leave me alone. He'll be with me through this trial because in the past, that one day, he dealt with me ten times. Forgetting curve. Well, 1946, the Qumran caves come into play. A little boy little shepherd boy was out there in 1946. He was out on the hills of Qumran. And one of his sheep got lost. And he knew there were some caves around. And so he started checking the caves. And he threw a rock in there to see if his goat, if a sheep was in there. Well, he didn't hear the goat. What he heard was a breaking of pottery. And so he said, wow, he says, I found something very interesting here. And so he let himself down. He went and wandered into the cave. And he found just jars and jars and jars of ancient written material. He didn't know what they were. So he took them and he thought it was just some, 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 some old leather. So he took them to the shoe guy, to the shoemaker. And the shoemaker bought them for a pittance of a dollar. Then he took them to the archbishop. And the archbishop bought them for a little bit more money. And then finally they found out that these are written scrolls from the second century B.C. And so you have the written word of God. God preserves it. 972 scrolls are found all the books except Esther and Nehemiah were in those, in those schools. See, prior to this, people thought that the word of God was just something that was not true. They couldn't go back into second century. There was this, it, they, they, they had some, some misguidings. They had some misunderstandings that the word of God, maybe somebody... Somebody went in and they, they played with the word and this is not really true. We don't have anything older. But when this 1946 came through and the Qumran caves came through, it put the critics to rest. 
God preserves His own Word. God protects His Word. God's Word is immutable. And you know what is more, even more interesting is that God's Word is for all generations. And God's Word is salvific. It saves. The written Word of God. So on Sunday's lesson was the divine revelation of the Bible. Monday's was the process of inspiration. Tuesday's the written Word of God. Well, let's look at Wednesday. The parallel between Christ and and scripture is there a parallel between Christ and scripture you might ask how does Christ fit into the scriptures well in the beginning was the word that is the Greek in John 1 1 it says enarche en hologos kai hologos en prostantion kaitios en hologos in the beginning existed the word and the word existed with God and the God was that word and look what he says in john 1 verse 14 the word became flesh it became sark it became flesh and made his dwelling made his tent among us we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth see this is what happened the word was in the beginning jesus was in the beginning he was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I am the Word. I am the life. Jesus, this is what happens. Word becomes flesh, and the flesh becomes Jesus. He came for one purpose, to redeem, restore, and to reconnect man to a lost world. See, Jesus, Yahshua, is Yesu Christu, the Son of God. God's only begotten Son. God in a form coming down and touching us where nobody could touch. He walked the streets of Palestine. He performed over, written record, records indicate that he performed over 34, 35 miracles. And those are only the ones that are documented. There are villages that Christ would go through and, and they would heal. He would, he would celebrate. He, he would make things that were wrong right. That is what the Word of God can do for us today. On Sunday, we talked about the divine revelation of the Bible. On Monday, we talked about the process of inspiration. On Tuesday, we talked about the written Word of God. And on Wednesday, we talked about the parallel between Christ and Scripture. Now comes a very interesting word. Thursday, understanding the Bible with faith. Understanding the Bible with faith. In faith. Paul says, I fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. A few years ago, a few years ago, my wife and I were in Rome, and we went to the Mamertine Dungeon. Dungeon is a place where, where Paul was kept, right before he was beheaded. And as we stood there, we wondered what faith was all about. The Hebrew word for faith is imna. And what does it mean? It's a divine spark that sets belief on fire. It's a divine spark that sets belief on fire. But it doesn't end there. See, Jesus says, God says in Deuteronomy 32, 4, He is the rock, His works are perfect, and all His ways are just, and a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is He. You see, what happens here is that faith is an attribute that belongs to God. And what man does is that man grabs onto this little bit of a spark and it ignites his whole belief and he becomes a living being. And what is faith? That's what faith is. See, when faith is based on events, on human needs, our faith falters. You see, what you have here is a faith that is based on events. So if your events are big and traumatic, like what some of us are going through right now, the faith at times doesn't, doesn't reach up to the pinnacle. In fact, it goes down as the events get up. As our troubles begin to show high, the faith begins to go down, down, down. And that is based on human needs. But if you look at the divine needs, look what happens here. <coughs> faith based on godly obedience. What happens here is very interesting because this faith is standard. It just stays up there because your hope and your trust is in nobody but in God. 
So when these, these events in life begin to touch you, your faith is not affected because you are trusting in God 100% because you know that He's going to make you, He's going, He's going to see you through this particular situation that you're in. So faith based on godly obedience is what, more, what we need. And so what you have here is Sunday's lesson, Divine Revelation of the Bible. Monday is the process of inspiration. Tuesday is the written word of God. Wednesday is the parallel between Christ and the scriptures. Thursday, understanding the Bible. And so finally we come to, the, to Friday. Well, Friday has a few questions, right? Now we are on Friday. Now what do we do with all this information? Here's where I love what Sister White has got to say in great controversy. She says the holy scriptures, the Bible, are to be accepted as an authoritative infallible revelation of His will. See, we have a problem with this. We pick and choose what we want to accept and we define what revelation is. We say, well, this particular part could not have been revealed. Maybe this was an added addendum by the writer. And so we tend to pick and choose and pretty soon the Bible begins to look like Swiss cheese. That's not what we want the Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. And she closes it by saying this, they are the standard of character. They are the revealer of doctrine. They are test of experience. So what does she mean by this, a standard of character? You see, your character must be based on the Scriptures. Who you are and what you do should be controlled by nothing else but the scriptures. Well, the second, revealer of doctrines. Every doctrine that you believe in, all that the, has, to be, has to be based and has to have its footing on the Bible. And finally, the third one is very interesting because the third one is the test of experience. You see, when you go through life, what is it that keeps you who you are? What identifies you? If the Bible identifies you, then, you have the, the, then your test of experience is good. Because when you, come to have a, when you come and have a problem, you're going to none other than the Word of God. Because that will see us through. Finally, in closing, I want to give you four, three, four promises. Number one, Psalm 51 10, 11, we know that. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. See, when Nathan the prophet came to, to David and he said, David, you have messed really bad with Bathsheba. You know what David said? Lord, Create in me a clean heart. He uses the same word that is found in Genesis chapter 1. When God says, Barashit, Barra. He uses that same word, Barra. Create in me. Don't patch my heart up, Lord. I want you to create in me. Take this whole heart away and give me a new heart. Well, the second one. I rise early before the sun is up. I cry out for help and put my hope in your words. Psalms 119. Here is David again. I rise early. That is a very interesting thing that you rise early before the sun is up. How many of us lay in bed not wanting to get up? That's not what David says here. He says, Lord, I rise up early. I cry out to you for help. Even before the day has begun, he's beseeching God for help. The third one that I want to leave with you today is found in Job chapter 5, verse 24. I was sitting in a parking lot just last week. And there was a group of Christians, they were praying in this pray, praying, they were praying inside this, uh, they were, of course, they were social distancing themselves and they were praying. They're invoking God, they're standing in the gap for, for our nation, that our nation might go through this, this, this virus problem. And God would come through in the end for us. And I know there are a lot of people who have been laid off. And we're going through some tough times. And I said, Lord, I don't know how I can make it through this time. And out of the blue, out of nowhere, I didn't even know this particular text existed, Job 5, 24. 
He said, he told me, he says, look up Job 524. I didn't even know it existed. The oldest book that was written, Job 5 verse 24. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. And you know, a few days later, this particular text came into play. I thank God because when you are in your dump, when you're in the lowest place, that is when God speaks to you. It seems like that is when we can understand, that's when we can listen to God. So the word of God is amazing. Here, look what 2 Corinthians 4, 9 says. We are pressed on all sides, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Come with these texts. I challenge you. Go back. Look at these texts. And memorize them. Because we have a God who loves us. We have a God that who is so interested in our lives. And that is what these lessons said, lesson quarter is all about. It tells us that the word of God is infallible. It is authoritative. It will see us through whatever terms, whatever situation we find ourselves to be in. God will take care of us. So as we close, let us go to the throne of grace. Let's ask God to come into our lives. And let's ask Him for a special blessing upon us this Sabbath day. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Almighty, an amazing, wonderful Father, we come before Your presence. You are the El Shaddai. You are the glorious one. You are the one who sits on the throne and there's nothing that, that can come between us and You, Lord. You are the God of Revelation 4. And we approach Your mighty throne with, with Lord, with with. With, with the trepidation of heart because we cannot even come into your presence, Lord. So we take on the righteousness of Christ and we enter into your most holy place and we talk to you. And Lord, we need your help. We ask that you be with us today as we go through these Sabbath hours. Bless us, Lord. Guide us. And Lord, bring a resolution to this, this virus that is hurting all of us as a country and as a nation, as a world. Go with us, Lord. Bless us. Forgive us of all of our sins and draw us close to you. We pray in your most holy name. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Thank you. And next week, we'll have more to follow. It'll be lesson number three. Thank you and have a wonderful Sabbath. God bless.